Welcome to this lecture series on the Great War. We're going to start with part one, the Progressive War. When we look at the Great War, we're looking at a war that goes by many names. We have the Great War, we have the First World War, World War I. Obviously, they didn't call it World War I back then because they didn't think there would be wars afterwards. As a matter of fact, at one point, it was even called the War to End All Wars. One thing that's for certain is that it did have a lot of very historically significant people involved with it. For example, George S. Patton will uh, cut his teeth driving tanks for the first time in the First World War. He'll be a prominent tank commander in World War II. Um, Harry S. Truman, one of the first uh, Cold Warrior presidents, uh, is going to uh, be an artilleryman in the Great War, right? Even in this picture, if you take a look here, you have a very famous person in this picture. And I know what you're all thinking. It's the dog, right? Yeah, it's the RCA dog. No, <clears throat> it's not the dog. It's not. When you look at that picture, if you look at the far left-hand side of that picture, you'll see that that man has a little X above his head. So while we look through it, uh, these other guys, and we see maybe a young Gomez Adams, a young Vladimir Putin, Chef Boyardee, Tom Cruise's dad, the guy there on the far left is actually Adolf Hitler, right? Matter of fact, he's Adolf Hitler back before he had the Hitler mustache. World War I will actually cause that Hitler mustache, as we now refer to it anyways, to come into being. Because in order to get his gas mask to properly seat on his face, having these large handlebar mustaches just didn't work. And so many people began shaving their mustache really thin, like Adolf Hitler did, right? Uh, the one thing we can say about this war for sure is that it was a global catastrophe. And it truly was a global catastrophe. We can look at it and see it as a generation lost. You had 20 million people die in the Great War. You're going to have another 21 million people who will be wounded. Um, you'll have 9.7 million military personnel killed, 7 million military personnel crippled. France is going to lose 11% of its population in the war. Its population after the war is actually going to trend downward because, for lack of a better phrase, they've lost an entire generation of breeding stock. A high gen an entire generation of young men will die in the war. You're going to have four major empires collapse, which is why you might refer to this war as the last great war of the monarchies. Four monarchies are going to collapse. You're going to have the end of the Austrian Empire, the Russian Empire, the German Empire, and the Ottoman Sultanate, right? Um, it is going to lead to the rise of the Soviet Union and uh, the beginning of the Cold War. Matter of fact, I make the argument that the Cold War actually began with the rise of Bolshevism and the establishment of the Soviet state in the post-World War, World War I era, not in the post-World War II era. We just kind of had a little break in there because of World War II and the common enemy of Nazism. Um, it's the origins of the fascist state. The uh, economic instability in Europe afterwards led to the rise of fascist uh, and socialist uh, political parties. And so you'll have the rise of Mussolini and the rise of Adolf Hitler as a result of the instability in Europe caused by the aftermath of World War I. Uh, it plays a role in the Great Depression. Now, the Great Depression is actually very complicated. There's a lot of moving parts to this, to the cause of it, and that's why it's so misunderstood. But World War I actually has a component piece of it that plays a role in the, the Great Depression that will start over a decade later. Uh, the Second World War. Now, again, the Second World War is very complicated. As a matter of fact, it's two wars in one. But there's aspects of the European uh, theater of the Second World War that have tie-ins to the First World War. I mean, for example, the rise of fascism, right? Uh, and it led to the United States becoming a superpower, right? The United States had had a willed power that we talked about even way back when we talked about the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century, and the Spanish-American War, right? Uh, but by the end of World War I, we had really established ourselves as a global power. And we were also the largest creditor nation on the planet by the end of the war, something that I bet you we probably wish we were today. Another striking thing about the Great War is that it was really a family affair. When we take a look at the three of the major powers involved in the war, Britain, Germany, and Russia, their leaders, Tsar Nicholas II, King George V, 
and Kaiser Wilhelm II were all first cousins, right? They were all connected in one way or another. A matter of fact, George and Wilhelm are both grandchildren of Queen Victoria. That's why you can see in this picture right here. In the center of the picture there, there you see Queen Victoria. If you look to her right, right, if you look left on the picture, you'll see Kaiser Wilhelm is sitting down right there to her right, and standing right behind him is George V, right? Um, but there's a lot of other relations. Europe is, uh, has got a lot of interrelations in it. A matter of fact, if you take a look at uh, the linkage to Queen Victoria in, uh, in Europe at the time of the start of the World War War, a lot of these people are related. Every one of these people that I'm about to list off are all first cousins, right? Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, Constantine I of Greece, Christian X of Denmark, Hakon VII of Norway, Maud of Wales, George V of England, Wilhelm II of Germany, Sophia of Prussia, Alexandra of Hesse, Maria of Edinburgh, and Victor Victoria of Battenberg, right? These people are all, are all children of either Queen Victoria of England or Christian IX of Denmark, right? And there's a lot of inter interrelations here too. Nicholas II, the first person I listed, happens to be married to Alexandra of Hesse. That is the Romanov uh, monarchy at this time. Right. And so this really is a family affair. And a lot of these guys are actually in communication with each other. Um, Wilhelm and George V have uh, have a habit of going on vacations together and they eventually will actually be at war with each other. The Great War was also a very ambiguous war, right? An argument is made that this was an accidental war or that was caused by a series of unfortunate events. Now, in reality, the war is far from an accident, but uh, its many escalations that led to war certainly caught a lot of people by surprise. And the fact that it escalated to a global scale was shocking to a lot of people. So a lot of people were left wondering when the war started, how did it start? Why did this start? There was a lot of confusion. It seemed kind of strange that an obscure assassination in a remote part of Eastern Europe led to a global confrontation, and yet it did. And when the war ended, it also ended under very strange circumstances. Germany had uh, sued for peace and had an armistice signed, um, but they were still in France at the time it took place. So if you were a German soldier in France in trenches in World War I, it was probably pretty confusing when the war suddenly ended. It's like, what do you mean the war ended? We're winning. We're still in France. We're 50 miles from Paris, right? Matter of fact, it led some German citizens to believe that there was some kind of ulterior backroom deal going on, some kind of, as they would put it, stab in the back, right? And the stab in the back theory uh, that grew in Germany blamed the uh, end of the war and the Germany, d German defeat on the Jews, and it's going to be people like Adolf Hitler and others of their ilk, of his ilk that are going to adopt this stab in the back theory that's going to lead to, again, ultimately the Holocaust, right? It's also a very transformative war. At the start of the war, you still had armies on horseback. You had brightly colored uniforms, right? This idea of set piece uh, battles. You had carrier pigeons and message runners, right? By the end of the war, you have tanks, you have flamethrowers being used in combat. You have uh, aircraft um, dotting the sky, machine guns, grenades, uh, rifled artillery, uh, weapons of mass destruction, right? Poison gas in this case, right? People aren't wearing brightly colored uniforms anymore. They're wearing gray or tan or green dungarees and steel helmets, no longer the nice little pretty helmet with the plumy flower that made a, or a feather on it that made it a great target, right? So the war was completely different by the end compared to what it looked like at the beginning, right? And it was a progressive war. Remember when I talked about progressivism, right? Uh, progressivism is the idea that you can address the problems of the day using science, technology, and social sciences to reform the existing systems. Well, these monarchs in Europe were certainly looking to reform the balance of power in Europe. And so they're being progressive. I thought we are going to use our science and technology to reform this balance of po power. Now, what a lot of them didn't realize was that reform would result in the elimination of their monarchy, right? Remember I said progressivism can often lead to unintended consequences. Well, this is certainly a great example of that. 